Well, good Thursday to everyone out there. Thank you for once again joining us for Church Facility Management Solutions webinar, uh, our monthly webinar that we offer once a month. Uh, today we are talking about what does it take to get your facility clean? So uh, is this the one you signed up for? Then you are at the right place. My name is Nathan Parr. I am a facility specialist with Cool Solutions Group. Uh, I will be administering and, and kind of running this webinar as we go through today. Um, during the webinar, if you have any time that you have a question that you want to ask, you can uh, raise your hand or go ahead on that control pane. You'll see there that you can submit a question via that control pane. You submit it. We're watching for those. As you ask your questions, we will work it in and we will get those answers to you. So uh, don't uh, hesitate. Ask the questions you want to ask and uh, we're here to get you the best information possible. And so to do that, we have linked up with the best of the best in the industry. So I'd like uh, to welcome today's guest, Mr. Jason Walton uh, from Hilliard, Texas. And Jason, welcome. And why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, and who you are? I appreciate it, Nathan. Uh, as Nathan said, my name is Jason Walton. I'm the uh, regional general manager for Hilliard of Texas. Uh, cover basically the southern part of the state for the Hilliard organization. I am uh, fortunate to have been in the cleaning industry for going on 22, almost 23 years now. Uh, hold about, uh, I think, eight different certifications in the industry, including uh, carpet care, wood floor care, uh, epoxy concrete care, uh, restroom sanitation disinfection uh, certifications as well as a green cleaning expert from the International Sanitary Supply Association. Um, got a couple of different degrees, one in psychology, my undergrad psychology and a, a master's of uh, business administration from uh, Baker University, go Wildcats. And um, yeah, I've been fortunate to work with thousands of different uh, facility operators from uh, different parts of the country for the last 22 years. And uh, I, I gladly will tell people most of all the best things I've learned in the industry, I've learned from from folks like yourself and being out in their facilities and watching um, how they do things and learning. And, and everybody does uh, cleaning a little bit differently. But one of the things that we're going to talk about today is ways to kind of look at standardizing your cleaning processes so you can you can predict the outcomes. All right, that sounds great. So folks, as you heard, uh, today's the day. You're going to get a lot of information, um, and some of it may be new to you. So again, if you've got questions, shoot them out to us, uh, and we're going to start going through and go through the process. So uh, folks, I'm going to go ahead, and we do have a uh, slide deck that we're going through today. I've made that available as a handout, so you can also uh, grab it yourself. So we'll go ahead and, and start going right through the slides. All right. Now that we got our pictures up, we've we've scared out all the cockroaches in everybody's facilities. So yep. we're, uh, we're good. All right. So there we go. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. So here, here's kind of what the this is going to be. It's a little bit of a, a kind of a 30,000 foot view of cleaning in commercial facilities. Obviously, there's uh, a lot of unique challenges in cleaning commercial facilities, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the nature of, of church facilities and, and how we operate and the uh, uh, the people who come in and out of the buildings and the soil loads they bring in. It's a little different than, than house cleaning. And what we find really in the commercial uh, cleaning industry is that we have a lot of cleaners, whether they be professional, part-time, volunteers, uh, whatever they may be, uh, trying to clean commercial facilities like we may clean our house, where we're used to cleaning our house, you know, usually once a week, maybe twice a week, depending uh, on our, our time, where the soil loads are a lot different. And it, so it really takes a little bit different strategy to clean commercial facilities. And when we talk about the word clean, uh, we're really kind of talking about a product. Clean, the way that we see it is the end result of procedures, tasks, processes, and, and programs. So in order to understand what the product of clean is, we need to kind of dive in and talk about each one of those uh, four categories and to how they relate to getting the cleanest facility that we can and keeping everybody happy and satisfied with the look and appearance of the facility. All right, so um, as we jump in and move to the next thing, um, you mentioned 
uh, and we're you're talking about a little bit about the difference between um, residential and commercial cleaning and, and kind of the load that goes through. So before we get into to everything there, uh, you and I have talked before and we've talked to uh, what's one of the biggest areas that that dirt gets into our facilities? Well, you know, if you if you really look at the, the front door uh, in, in most commercial applica uh, applications about there's usually a couple entrances, entrance points where 80 to 85 percent of all of the people who are entering the building will come in those couple of doors. And so one of the one of the strategies uh, that is good to employ is focus your time and energies where you're going to get the greatest return for that time, energy and, and, and budget dollar. Um, and obviously the, the front door is usually a lot of those, but we may have a business office, we may have a sanctuary entrance. So focusing on the kind of places where that type of traffic is going to, um, those activities are going to help negate the, the levels of soils coming in from that traffic. The, the other thing is, is really the, uh, the types of soils that come in. If you look at a lot of the entrances to a lot of commercial facilities, there's usually a parking lot and, and that could be concrete, could be asphalt. I know here in, in South Texas, uh, you know, we suffer from a lot of heat and we get uh, tar residues coming in from a lot of those asphalt parking lots that can create issues that we may not be dealing with in our residential cleaning uh, uh, environment. So, and that, that makes us change some of our strategies, have different tools and, and uh, approach those things a little different ways. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to uh, thank you for that because uh, folks, as we're, as we're talking, that's, that's real important to realize that without training and we're going to get to that. So uh, I'm giving you a preview of some stuff we're going to talk about at the very end, but without training, um, it's easy to not hit those areas we, we need to hit. So uh, as we jump in, sort of through the procedures, tasks, processes, and programs. Uh, so let's talk about the first thing, the uh, uh, procedure. All right. So, per, per, yeah, procedures are, are basically the uh, what product, the methods that we're going to use, the tools and equipment, uh, and the cleaning processes, and even the inspection standards. So there's... Um, a lot of lot of different things that go into that, and that's that's obviously a, a wide swath, and we're going to talk a little bit about more of that uh, here in this slide. So, the product, what are we what are we trying to clean for? Are we trying to clean for appearances? Are we trying to clean uh, clean for germ removal? For those of you who have uh, schools, preschools, or, or nurseries, um, you know, germ removal, microorganism removal is something that is uh, needs to be part of that equation because that's different than if we're dealing with just uh, regular regular uh, soil issues and and cross contamination issues just from general cleaning. Uh, the types of soils, like I mentioned, uh, do we have things that are oily and sticky? Uh, you know, one of the things that we see in a lot of our church facilities is, you know, there it's a great gathering place for people, and that means there's lots of coffee, there's lots of sodas and carpet. There are things that uh, are going to create challenges if we not understand the things that we're cleaning. So loose, crusty uh, minerals, which are usually going to be dry. Um, different than clean something oily and sticky. Dyes and paints, uh, obviously we've got a lot of uh, project maintenance work that happens in commercial facilities and uh, things like paints, tar, uh, some of adhesives that we may be using in the mechanical applications um, are a little different than you may experience uh, in other environments. The application method is how are we gonna apply the product once we decide what product is the best fit um, you can uh, spray it on, wipe it on uh, in spray methods using things like a, a foam gun or a pump up sprayer. When we talk about the application of cleaning chemicals, um, there's really about four things that we need to kind of keep in mind that help us clean. And to take the least amount of elbow grease out of it, we need to give the chemicals time to do what they do. And depending on the situation, whether that's trying to limit or kill microorganisms or trying to take stains out of carpet, uh, we refer to it in, on the professional side of the business as dwell time. Are we given the chemical the, the proper uh, necessary uh, time to do what it, it's going to do chemically? 
and that uh, will uh, determine, you know, be determined by the application method. Pump-up sprayers are a good way, particularly for cleaning uh, the, the hard-to-attack stains. Uh, again, carpet stains, those kind of things that may get into floors. Uh, doing wide areas may require you to get away from a trigger sprayer and go to something pump up. Uh, wipes, uh, wipes can be very convenient. They can be more more costly than than other types of messes. But you know, if 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 we need to do things quickly, wipes may be a good alternative. And then on the application methods, the you know the 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 thing that we prefer to use is equipment things that allow us to mechanize cleaning processes as much as we can. I uh, can't mechanize everything in the in the cleaning world, but there you'd be surprised there's about 97% of it that can be mechanized as long as that fits into your cleaning processes and and your budget. So with with tools, moving on into that part of the procedures, trying to find the tools and the equipment that are going to allow us to do the job most efficiently and effectively. Uh, we always recommend that you start with the least aggressive cleaning method first. We call it the finest first, or use the use the type of system that is going to cause the least amount of damage to the asset, to anybody's health, or to the environment. And a lot of that is mainly just trying to protect the assets. You know, we we you know obviously wouldn't want to you know see people putting bleach into carpets or bleach onto flooring. Uh, one bleach is a, a very aggressive agent. Uh, it's it's hazardous. Um, so we 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 want to be cautious of using things like that when it comes to uh, say floor cleaning. Uh, using a neutral floor cleaner, which is chemically pH neutral is going to be where we would recommend that somebody start. And the reason why is it's not going to remove floor finish. It's not going to damage anything. Most of them are green sill certified. If that doesn't do the job, then we move up to something that's a little bit higher or lower on the pH scale that may may do the job. But again, selecting the right equipment that's going to allow us to be efficient is going to be um, the preferred way. Okay. I want to jump in there real quick and, and let uh, everyone listen and know that um, Jason has made available uh, to us some of the, these handouts and one of those handouts talks about the cleaning science and the pH if that's nothing if that's not a topic that you've really dived into I encourage you to to get that handout because they've put together an excellent presentation that talks about the pH and how uh, determining and picking the right chemical will make your job that much easier. So it's a great handout. It's one of the handouts that's available to you right now. So please take a look at that because one thing um, we've, we've mentioned, we talked about before, and I want to just make sure this is a good place to put it in. We talk about chemicals that that uh, take care of germs. And you, you mentioned about dwell time, not only for allowing it to work. Uh, I'd like you to go ahead and just say a little bit about what it really means to have dwell time in a kill claim for those um, those disinfectants and those sanitizers, um, sure. just so we we can do that. Okay, great. So, and, and this is something that um, is is uncommon knowledge. Uh, the difference between first, we'll start the difference between a disinfectant and a sanitizer because they are two different chemical agents and the processes and how they do their jobs are different. Um, in Here in the United States and in actually most of uh, the industrialized world, uh, disinfectants, EPA registered disinfectants, ours or anybody else's, so if you're using Clorox wipes or you're using, you know, what, it doesn't matter what brand it is, they're, the EPA registers disinfectants as pesticides. And if you think about it, um, they, they kill organisms. A pesticide is nothing else than a way to kill organisms. Um, you, you know, usually we think of cockroaches or mice or, or other things, but essentially what we're doing is we're doing that on a microbial scale. So when we use the word sanitizer and, and disinfectants, the, the, the disinfecting process is meant to kill anything that is on a surface that meets the kill claim of that particular disinfectant. So with the proper dwell time, which for most of the standard disinfectants in our industry is a wet dwell time of 10 minutes. And that's important to understand, it's a wet dwell time. So if I spray a disinfectant on a surface and I wipe it away immediately with a dry cloth, I'm removing its ability to stay wet on the surface and do what it does. Now, 
it's going to kill some of the stuff right away, some of the real easy microorganisms, uh, the single cell organisms that are easy to kill, things like E. coli and some of the you know more run-of-the-mill ones. Some of the more complex ones, like norovirus and just the more complex cellular organisms, microorganisms, um, it needs that extra dwell time in order to eat through the outer membranes of the cells of those microorganisms. So that dwell time allows it to do that. So that's disinfecting. Uh, the, the term sanitation or sanitizing is really meant to, in the process of putting down a chemical barrier to inhibit the growth of microorganisms. So one is killing it, the other one is not allowing it to take root uh, or to prevent it from actually being able to to attach itself to the surface. So um, the reason why we want those two things is they really have uh, two different purposes. So if I am cleaning a restroom and I'm trying to, uh, you know, get rid of uh, the microorganisms that may exist in the fecal matter or, or urine or, or just the different body fluids that we would find in a restroom, I'm going to want to kill anything that is there uh, and then wipe it away, remove it, suck it up, you know, however, whatever method we're using so that we can dispose of it properly, usually down a drain. Uh, if I'm sanitizing, sanitizing is usually going to be in areas where we, we, we have human contact that needs to be um, uh, uh, able to use the space when we're doing those processes. So if you think of like a food preparation area where we're trying to sanitize countertops, um, we're not getting the, the same kill claims or the same level of uh, of cleaning that we would have with a disinfectant, but we also don't have to rinse it, wet rinse it off, uh, and we don't necessarily need to have the same dwell times. We're just trying to prohibit the growth of microorganisms at that point, not kill whatever is there. Uh, sanitizers, like instant hand sanitizers, will kill some microorganisms. Again, the real basic stuff, but uh, disinfecting requires a dwell time. You can always look at the instructions or the label on the product that you're using, and it will indicate what the kill claim is. Uh, and what we're talking about kill claim is the spectrum of microorganisms in which that product was designed to kill. Okay. And and uh, that that ties in, folks, when we – that last thing when we talk about procedures, uh, standards. <laughs> so you've got to make sure you're using the right product in the right way with the right tools, methods, and, and application to get your standard, uh, if it's going to be hospital clean versus uh, warehouse clean, right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, and one other thing I'll say before we get off uh, the, the disinfection and, san and sanitization issue, um, this is, a, I guess, a chance to kind of jump on the soapbox from an industry standpoint. Um, we are very, very, very much trying to encourage people to do one of two, or to, well, actually to do two things limit the use of disinfectants when they're not required. So again, if I'm going to go in and I'm going to clean areas, spray a disinfectant and then instantly remove it, I'm not really utilizing the disinfectants for its, for its purposes. But because they are registered by the EPA as pesticides, they are not the friendliest of products, ours or anybody else's. So we, we always tell people, use the disinfectants where you need to kill microorganisms. If, you, if your goal is not to kill microorganisms, then don't use a disinfectant. What we're finding is there, just like there's antibiotic resistant uh, pathogens, we're also finding disinfecting resistant organisms that as these organisms adapt, what they're doing is they're, they're becoming harder to kill. So it forces us to use more aggressive disinfectant strategies, which isn't really good for the user. So again, only use them when you have to disinfect. The other thing is the use of bleach. Um, I, I usually, when we, when we do these things, I, I will challenge people that I'll give them a thousand dollars if they can tell me the active cleaning ingredient in bleach. And usually everybody, the first one they'll throw out is chloride or chlorine. Um, the answer is it's a pretty safe bet because there isn't one. Uh, bleach is a very corrosive material. Uh, we sell it. We, we stopped manufacturing it decades ago just because it requires a separate plant. It's basically, you know, you're making stuff in a, in a big bomb factory when you're dealing with bleach. Very, very hazardous. Um, but the, the utilization of products like bleach, uh, although it can have a kill claim for a lot of different microorganisms and pathogens, it has to be properly diluted and properly labeled. 
And most of the bleaches that we use, like if I go down and just pulled off the grocery store or Walmart or Target, most of that bleach, if it's a 5% bleach, by the time you actually use it and you're ready to, to do something with it, it's 2.5%. So if you have to mix it at a, a 1 to 3 application, that's when it was out of the vat. So it's highly corrosive. It's highly dangerous. It's one of the most dangerous items in our industry. And we try to persuade people bleach was meant to be a disdaining agent for textile cleaning. It, it really has very, very, very limited applications in cleaning. Um, does a great job of damaging surfaces. And if you mix bowl cleaner and bleach, you have the base compounds for, for tear gas. So uh, almost every year, somebody nice. in our industry dies um, uh, by improperly using bleach. And usually it comes with mixing a chemical uh, with bleach that you know, they don't react well and, and somebody ends up losing their life. So, so stay away from bleach uh, whenever possible. Um, again, it, it was meant to be a textile cleaner to, to de-stain or remove the color out of soils in textiles. It was never meant to be a cleaning, uh, a cleaning um, product. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So that that's uh, and I always tell people if you use it at home, don't you know don't use it in commercial <laughs> applications, don't use it in residential applications, other than if it's in your uh, utility room to, to to take out grass stains and uh, uh, in your kids' uh, baseball uniform. So uh, on on to methods for this part. So there's there's wet methods of application. You know we've talked about some of them, things like mops, microfiber equipment. Uh, sprayers, uh, tears from your team, as we threw in here. Yeah. Um, sometimes there's uh, lots of that yeah, going around. Paying thing. attention. <laughs> <laughs> and and then there's there's dry methods. So when we look at uh, from a professional cleaning standpoint, any time that I can remove a soil when it's dry, it's usually easier, faster, and more cost effective. Anytime that I add water or cleaning solution to a soil, the first thing I usually get is mud. So if I can vacuum it, if I can sweep it, if I can wipe it away, that is always your best bet. It's cheaper, faster, uh, and usually going to give you a better result. Uh, but when we do have to use wet methods is usually when we have bonded soils. That's our technical term for when the the soil is sticking to the surface. Uh, so whether that's a stain in your carpet or dried mud uh, that has been chemically bonded to a hard floor, that's usually when we have to use wet methods uh, to do that. Uh, one note on mops, if you're using a traditional string mop, um, Nathan and I were just talking about this before we started uh, the, the webinar. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but a string mop, the conventional string mop's been around for a long time, was patented over 150 years ago to put tar on a roof. It has never received a patent as a cleaning device. Uh, it was meant to be an application device, which is why we have it here in, in this slide. It was meant to apply a cleaning agent or compound to a surface, just like it was patented to put tar on a roof. It's an application device, not a cleaning device. Uh, microfibers, whether it be a cloth or a mop, were patented as cleaning devices. So they do anywhere from a 30 to 60 percent better job of removing soils from a surface. So if you have an opportunity uh, to talk with your vendor about the about using microfiber cleaning programs, one of the best returns on an investment in our industry definitely gets the surfaces cleaner, requires a lot less chemical. Um, and here it is a chemical manufacturer and we and we sell microfiber. We encourage it. Uh, our goal is to uh, only use chemicals if we need to. But there are some of the tools out there that definitely can make the job easier by selecting the right method and the right tool for that. And then lastly is kind of the standard. Uh, you're going to have to find a standard with the stakeholders in your facilities to find what, what your definition of clean is going to be. And here on this slide, we put hospital clean uh, versus uh, warehouse clean. Uh, and, and, and there's a distinction. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out a couple acronyms. Uh, of some governing bodies in our industry that help define what clean means. There's uh, the International Sanitary Supply Association, which is the, uh, we call ISSA. Um, it, they are the ones who 
in our industry help us write standards. Uh, they take a collective mix of stakeholders. So, you know, uh, folks like yourself, K through 12 education, healthcare, uh, academia, scientists, and say, okay, how do we define clean? How do we define certain levels uh, of clean and what that means? And that's what they do. They have a program called CIMS, C-I-M-S, which stands for the Cleaning Industry Management Standard. And what that helps us do is to help us try to quantify uh, what what we mean by clean. And depending on your organization and your budget, your soil loads and, and, your, uh, and your staffing, you may be only able to reach certain levels of clean. Uh, okay. So another organization that has had a lot of input into that is APPA, A-P-P-A, -P -P used to stand for the uh, American Physical Plant Managers Association, but now it just actually goes by acronym APPA. Back in 1982, they came up with a cleaning levels one through five. It was the, really the first attempt to add a general standard for when we talk about the word clean, what does it mean? And their level is one through five, with one being the cleanest, uh, what we would say here is hospital clean. And really even within the hospitals, a level one would be a surgical ward type clean, where it is sanitized, disinfected, and cleaned at the, the highest level you could possibly clean something. Uh, it's where you also might find a clean room in a manufacturing facility, uh, something of that nature. But most of the rest of the hospital would be at a cleaning two. Um, and then you go to a clean level three, which is where you find more, more commercial facilities. The vast majority of customers in our industry strive for a cleaning level three, kind of the medium standard. And then four is less clean and five is what we call trash and dash. You're doing the, the, the bare minimum required to keep a, uh, a level of sanitation in the facility, usually not a great level. And the reason why we, we look at those ranges is we can usually predict what's going to happen to the occupants of the building. Uh, you may have heard the, the, the term sick building syndrome. Um, indoor air quality issues can come from lack of sanitation and cleanliness. 60%, uh, I'm sorry, 80% of all soils that come in uh, from a building come from outside. Uh, the other 20% is, to be honest with you, it's kind of gross, but dead skin flakes uh, from the people who are in the building. So if, we, if we're if we doing the bare minimum trash and dash, we're not vacuuming, we're not you know mopping, sweeping floors, we have all these indoor contaminants that are in the building and being flushed and recycled through the building uh, through the HVAC system. So that those are kind of the standards of defining levels of clean. Um, there are a couple other things, and I'll just throw these out there because it's it's kind of a trend. I don't say a fad, but more of a trend in our industry. Um, when we talk about measuring clean, believe it or not, there are ways to actually measure clean. Uh, there's a device called an ATP meter. Uh, it stands for added, added, adenosine triphosphoric, uh, ADP does. And what it is, it's an enzyme that all living organisms leave behind on a surface. And what this meter does, you can get one for about a $1,000. Um, you have a swab, you swab a fixture, uh, whether it be a handle, doorknob, a phone, whatever it may be, computer, keyboard. And the, the industry has defined an acceptable range of ATP that is present on, on those contact surfaces. So it's a way to swab it, put it in the meter, it takes about 30 seconds and it comes out with a reading and tells you how much, how much of that enzyme, uh, which gives you an indication of how much microorganism activity is on that surface. So the industry is shifting towards trying to define it at, when we say clean, that is a range of ATP on a surface. Um, okay. and, and really just, it, it, again, it's kind of new. Um, it's something that most people don't think of that when they think of cleaning, they're thinking of, does it look clean? The APA standards, the level one through five, and most of the industry accepted, uh, is more subjective. It's, does it look clean? Does it smell clean? Does it feel clean? Right. Okay. So, and if anybody out there that's on this webinar gets one of those meters, uh, we expect some information and feedback uh, back. If you guys use it, we want to know. Uh, we want to see. Um, so just I'm throwing that out there. Use the forums on the on the website and let us know what you find. 
So. It's uh, it, it, it's it can be scary. Um, <laughs> and, and I will I will caution people that it's um, uh, there there have there are some businesses out there that actually do consulting work where they pay you know you pay a service they'll come in they'll do a take ATP meter readings. Um, it can it can be very eye opening, but you know it, if you have a daycare or a nursery. Uh, and, and, you know, young children are vulnerable uh, in those situations. That may be one application where you want to make sure that you you have a standard in maybe just that area of your facility where you may not care about that level and every other. So, you know, you can kind of pick okay. your battles in, in that in that way. Okay. All right. So let's let's talk about some tasks. Yeah. So this is kind of a quick and easy one, but essentially a task is what you think it is. It is. Um, it, it is something that is accomplished. Uh, could be several procedures within uh, within the task. Um, think of it as like empty trash, vacuum floor, disinfect sink. And the reason why we throw that in here is there's there's really kind of two things that we got to keep in mind that really determine the level of clean, and that is what task are we doing, and at what frequency do we do those tasks. So that's why we put task okay. in here as part of that process. Okay. And so as we go on, speaking so, of processes. <laughs> yeah, process. So process is really kind of the important part, but it's essentially nothing less than a series of procedures. Um, and you can have a uh, several processes within a procedure. Um, and, and I'll use example like e extracting carpet. Uh, the processes involved in carpet cleaning are, are um, and, and it depends on if you're doing interim or restorative, but vacuuming the carpet first, applying a pre-spray, uh, extracting it with a wet extractor, then applying some sort of treatment on afterwards, whether that be a deodorizer, uh, odor counteractor, whatever it may be. Those are the processes within the procedures of how to clean carpet. So it, it's a series of procedures uh, that are involved. All right, that, that makes sense. And so as we move on, so now what's a program? <laughs> yeah. So really what all of that is, is leads us to a, a program. So this is where, and we'll spend some time kind of talking about the programs because it's really kind of the meat and potatoes of, of what we're talking about today. But um, the program is the summation of expectations, procedures, tasks, and processes as you've defined them. Uh, and again, there's, there, it's, a lot of this is determined by picking the frequency at which you do the task making sure that we have the proper procedures and the proper processes in place. Because uh, if we don't do a task properly, we probably can't predict the outcome. And what, right. what we shoot for in the commercial cleaning industry is if, if I do these things correctly, if I have standard operating procedures that are, that are written and defined, and again, because in, 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 in the church environment, you may be using people who are volunteers. They, they're not professional cleaners. So we have to be able to find easy ways to train the cleaners in, in, in our facilities to uh, accomplish the, the, the task uh, successfully. And that's where kind of the, 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 the concept of program comes in of pick your program, define it, make sure that it is understandable to everybody and can be easily replicated. So uh, if I've got somebody that is an expert at, say, carpet care, it's going to be hard to teach a volunteer to be an expert at carpet care. Right. So what that, what that makes me do is that makes me define my procedures and my processes so that I can replicate that, I can replicate that task time and time again. So what we try to do is find the things that take the least amount of knowledge, but deliver the greatest result. Um, okay. and, and, and there's some things that we can kind of talk about, a lot of uh, future topics that we could kind of share with with uh, with everybody, um, of what some of those are, because some of them are easier. But I already, I already kind of mentioned one. Um, one of them is like the use of microfiber. Uh, right. I can give somebody a tool where I don't have to change the process a lot, I can give them a microfiber mop that allows them to remove 30 to 60% more soils per pass, use less water, 90% less water, and has a very high return on investment, and it's easier and less fatiguing for the user, better than I can give them an old-time old wet string mop and a bucket, 
which requires a lot of elbow grease, right. that really isn't very efficient. So picking those things to allow them to do that is um, is what we're trying to focus on a program. But as you mentioned earlier, Nathan, it's about kick, p- picking the right chemicals, picking right. you know the right the right tools. You know, do I have the right equipment? Uh, doesn't mean you got to go crazy and go out and spend a bunch of money buying equipment. It just means you have to have you have to have tools that are going to be effective and efficient at the processes you're asking people to undertake. Right. And we, we've got, as you guys probably have noticed, we've got a poll running. Uh, We're going to let it run for another uh, half a minute or so. But as we've been talking about all this stuff, uh, the question is, you know, how, how many hours do you train? Uh, Because all of what we've talked about, the procedures, task process programs, like Jason was just talking about, how, how do you teach that and how do you then enforce that? And how do they reproduce it? And I think that's a great word uh, that you mentioned is, is how do you reproduce the result? Yep. Um, and or maybe more appropriately, uh, those of us who've, who've been in the church having to clean it, um, how do we stop reproducing the wrong result? Which, <laughs> right. is, which is complaints and, and uh, concerns that it's not getting uh, done and done well. So. Uh, I've got the poll. It's going to be open for another 10 seconds or so. I've got uh, most of the crowd has voted. Um, and again, I'm, this is a, uh, I'm, I'm previewing. At the end of this program, we're going to talk about some cool things that Hilliard does when it comes to training and, and doing this stuff. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'm going to go ahead and the poll is now closed. And uh, let's share the results. So I have everybody that uh, that voted in on this webinar. Here's where we fall. Is anybody surprised by that result? Uh, Jason, are you surprised by that? No, uh, I would 46%. say that's pretty pretty standard from what what we see. And and you know, and be honest with you, we even see this in say like a large school district where they spend millions and millions of dollars on their custodial operations, um, and they have defined a level of clean as it looks good. And as we just kind of talked about with, you know, things like ATP and microorganisms, um, looking good, it may not get us real clean. Looking good and clean are not, are, are not the same thing. Now, usually if something's clean, it does look good. You know, we, and we talk about this with things like odors. Uh, we all are conditioned to think certain odors smell clean. You know, if you think about pine saw, fabuloso, some of the other things that we uh, are ingrained, even the smell of bleach, people associate the smell of be- bleach with being cleaned. Right. Um, we, on the professional side, we talk about clean actually has no smell. Uh, the, re- the removals of soil and microorganisms to a level where they do not cause odors is clean. Uh, right. Now we can ma- we can mask dirt. Um, we, we, we're, a lot of us are pretty good at masking dirt or moving dirt around uh, where people don't notice it. But you know things like soil loads in carpet, for example. Eighty uh, percent of the soils that are in most commercial carpet are not visible uh, from the surface. So if I look at carpet and I say, well, it looks clean. But if it's got a bunch of sand in it, let's say, you know, the average grain of sand has 60 cutting edges on it, that every time somebody steps on that, what they're doing is they're cutting the fiber out of the carpet. So when we get those, uh, we call them traffic patterns. But a lot of what those traffic patterns are is the presence of soils that have actually damaged the the material to a point where it, it visibly looks different. Um, so it can it can affect our budgets as well. You know, if we have to replace carpet, um, most people don't know this as well, but the average commercial carpet is engineered to last 15 to 20 years if properly maintained. Um, okay. We we don't see a lot of carpet that's greater than 20 years old in the industry, and and frankly, a lot of people are replacing carpet after seven years because it has uglied out, not worn out. It's uglied out. Sure. And that's a lot of times that's just impl- improper processes and uh, procedures. Yeah. Um, okay. So we, we kind of talked about it. You kind of talked it earlier. So when we talk cleaning standard, it's more than just those, the four things that you put together uh, to create that process frequency. So let's, let's talk about frequency a little bit. Um, is there different needs depending on type of area when it comes yeah. to frequency? 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we look for in, in the programs that we try to establish in commercial facilities is not all areas are created equal. And, and you can think of most commercial facilities, a church, for, for example, uh, there may be areas that are used once, maybe twice a week within the facility. There may be the office areas that are used every day. Uh, so fight the battles where the soil is and where the soil is going to come into. Uh, so concentrate your cleaning efforts. And what we typically do is we'll take a blueprint of a building and we'll, we'll ask the building operators, tell me where everybody comes in. And then what we do is we color code the cleaning process. So the things like vacuuming, if I'm going to vacuum carpet, instead of vacuuming the whole facility wall to wall, what I want to focus is 80% of my vacuuming in the areas where 80% of the soil's at. And that's going to allow me to keep the soils from migrating to other parts of the facility. Um, so if you have a multi-story facility, uh, the first floor is always dirtier than the second floor. Second floor is dirtier than the third floor if you have a third floor. And we call it soil, okay. uh, uh, soil migration. So focus on those efforts to where they're at. We also talked about um, if, if I have a daycare, a preschool, a nursery, those areas where the level of microorganisms uh, can be more impactful than other areas. Uh, I want to focus my cleaning efforts there because obviously that causes, you know, can cause some health concerns restroom cleaning and disinfection, 80% uh, of all sicknesses that are that are uh, contracted in a commercial facility can be tracked to the restroom. So if we can if we can control the level of microorganisms and bacteria in restrooms, we can keep them from migrating outside of those areas into the offices, into the sanctuaries, into the fellowship halls. We can keep them contained. Uh, so a lot of what we try to do with, with overall cleaning concepts is where can we contain the soils, trap them, remove them the easiest, least expensively, and the same thing with microorganisms. Isolate them, trap them, remove them uh, as least uh, expensively as you can. Okay, so the more we do, can do to keep them from getting in and moving around, the better off. Yep. So um, th there's, I think I've even... Uh, on the church facility management solutions, we've even had a few writings about entrance matting. Uh, so if, if, uh, if y'all aren't using entrance matting and, and not using it a, properly, you're making it harder to clean your building and to keep it clean. Fair statement? Yep, 80, 80, you know, we talked about 80% of all soils that are in a commercial facility come from the outside. A proper matting system, which, ISSA defines proper matting system as one that that you can, we call them footfalls, but 15 footsteps, uh, which typically is about 15 feet uh, of matting. Most commercial facilities don't have 15 feet of matting. 15 feet of matting will control 85% of the soils at the door. So we call it the custodian mat, you know, the, 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 the name mat, the term mat, is the right. custodian that never calls in sick. And all we have to do for Matt is vacuum him. So in my in in the strategy of where do I focus my time and energy, I would take care of Matt really well, because if he can stop 85 percent of the soils at the door and all I have to do is vacuum him daily or every other day, depending on you know the, the number of people coming in the facility, I'm going to do more right then and there to control soils than any other thing I can do. ISSA tells us it costs $600 to remove one pound of soil out of a commercial facility. And if you can think about it, a lot of that soil is microscopic. You know, we're talking about fine dirt and dust. Right. That's what we do when we vacuum, when we extract, when we clean. We're removing those soils. But at the end of the day, if you were to take that all and you cut open that vacuum bag and weigh it, you know, what you're going to find is it takes a long time to get a, a pound of soil out. Right. And it's expensive. So if I can contain it at the door, if I can fight that battle there, I'm way better off. One other thing that, that I always like to harp on, because I see this a lot, it doesn't matter if it's in uh, churches, university schools, when we're taking care of the landscaping and the grounds, the use of blowers. Uh, so essentially what we're doing is we're cutting all of this material, a lot of it's organic material, grass, weeds, you know, hedge clippings, leaves there. And we're taking that. And we're cutting it and we're blowing it back out in the parking lot or we're, we're channeling it in a deal. All it takes is the wind to reverse 
the next day and all that stuff is coming back in my facility. So we kind of create our own problem sometimes. Now we have to cut grass, we have to take care of landscaping. So what we suggest is get an outdoor sweeper, a little mechanical sweeper. Uh, it, it actually is faster at removing the debris from the outside. Uh, you can even get them motorized, you can get them with an electric battery, you can get them in with propane, but you can utilize those uh, and to, we can trap the soils and we don't have to fight them again another day. So just some of the little things that we can do to help ourselves out and, you know, may involve, you know, talking to the landscapers and saying, hey, instead of instead of taking a blower and blowing the stuff around, can we collect it, throw it in the dumpster and then we don't have to worry about it, you know, fighting it on uh, on Tuesday if we uh, mowed on Saturday. Sure. Sir. So just a couple of things to think about, folks, uh, as we talk about clean. Um, bottom line, the less we bring in, the less we have to worry about getting rid of. So that's always uh, advantageous. Um, and matting is, over time, much more affordable than, uh, than additional staff members. So with cleaning standards and, and like we talked about, um, let me go back one. Sorry, I advanced it a little quick. When you deviate, like Jason said, you've got to be uh, you've got to be critical. Uh, apply critical thinking where you're going to deviate from frequency and and how often you're doing it. Um, and we kind of put something there. It may be okay in non-critical areas, but it's got to be defined in your SOPs, your standard uh, operating procedures. So. I'm throwing up a poll here because uh, here's kind of a question. And Jason, if you wouldn't mind just kind of talking a little bit about written cleaning programs, how yeah, important absolutely. are they? So one of the one of the things that some of the industry standard bearers allow us to do is to kind of define what um, what those cleaning programs should look like. Uh, I mentioned the ISSA SIMS program, Cleaning Industry Management Standard. What what they have tried to do is define what the best practices for cleaning are. Uh, and again, it's not just Hilliard saying it. It's not just Jason saying it. It's this is what the industry has agreed for cleaning commercial facilities is the proper way, tasking and frequency to clean commercial buildings. And so what, what we have done uh, as a company, we have a couple of things. And, and you, can, you can go to our website, hilliard.com, and, and research these. Um, there, there's uh, probably a Hilliard distributor in your area, if not a, a Hilliard corporate owned facility that we have a program called CCAP or CAP, and it stands for Cleaning Costs Analysis Program. And what it allows us to do is we actually can come in and we, we actually measure your facility down to the room level. We put those inputs into a computer software program, and it will tell you the proper tasking based on the SIMS, Clean Industry Management Standard criteria for cleaning that area type. So it uses the app a level one through five. So we shoot for a level three clean in most areas, two if it's in a critical uh, health environment. Um, and, and that kind of defines those processes for us. And it, it even can add automation in things like microfiber, different types of equipment. And then what we use from that is to generate standard operating procedures and then job cards or task cards. So since a lot of you may use um, volunteers or staff members to clean your facilities if you don't have professional cleaners. Um, those are good things to hand out. They're usually five through seven tasks of how to clean an office, how to clean your sanctuary, how to clean a restroom. And they're color coded, they're number coded, and they, they we call it cleaning by numbers, but allows you to kind of take a lot of the guesswork out. It allows you to kind of define your cleaning processes based on industry standards. So if uh, and you can see some examples, if you go to our website at Hilliard.com, it'll it'll show you some of that. But th there are none of its rocket science. Um, we just have taken the time. We're fortunate. We're a large organization and we have people who kind of do this uh, full time for a living that research these things. We we have tried to professionalize the cleaning industry as much as we can so that we can um, we can give you guys the best tools available with the latest information and technology as to, uh, to how to accomplish your task. Nathan, are you there? Yeah, and I'm just apologize oh, for that. Yeah, 
No, uh, so obviously 70% of us don't have one, just like our training is is down. Uh, most of us don't do a whole lot of training. Uh, and that's not an aha or a gotcha to anybody. When, when I was doing it for 12 years, uh, I was in the same boat. Uh, so it's something though that we can change. And, and uh, full disclosure, you guys know, I, I, I'm honest with you. Uh, I used when in my facility, the CCAP, and that's what we've been talking about. And I've been referring that we're going to talk about even more at the end, uh, that program. So if it's an option for you, if you can find it in your area, uh, I'd highly encourage you to check it out, at least go on the website and look at it. Great information. Uh, a lot of the knowledge and information we even share on CFMS uh, was born and originated uh, and done by uh, Hilliard and training that was received through CCAP. So, we are, and this is uh, this is kind of we're 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 at the close to the end, folks. Uh, yeah, we're getting there. Kind of a wrap up. Yep. So, c kind of in summation, you know what we're what we've talked about is you know how the procedures describe how to clean a particular surface or asset. You know what are what are the what are the tasks? What are the processes involved with all all of that? Uh, processes are the sequence of procedures. And the processes are obviously important, as, as just as important as everything else. Uh, in the SIMS, the Clean Industry Management Standard I referred to, they're actually defined the, the process of how to clean. So here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, here's step four. And again, we're trying to do it so that we can take people who may not be professional cleaners to be able to adequately and effectively clean a, a surface or an area. Uh, so we, we try to take a lot of guesswork out of it. Uh, the task might involve several procedures. Um, and, you know, again, we talked about emptying trash, disinfecting sinks, those kind of things. Uh, and the program is really kind of all of that combined into a predictable outcome. Uh, if I follow the processes, if I follow the procedures and I have the right task, I should be able to predict within 95% uh, assuredness what I'm going to get on the other end and that's what we're trying to accomplish with uh, a standardized cleaning program is predictable outcomes uh, and again the challenges that you guys have in in your facilities maybe you don't have trained professional staff doesn't mean we can't do some training or, or do some education to make it um, easier safer faster less costly more effective um, just takes a little bit of thought and effort. Uh, be honest with you, if you if you Google cleaning procedures and standards or YouTube it, you can find a lot of information out there that um, is most of it's correct and most of it's pretty decent. Uh, but there is a lot of information, and obviously going you know going through CFFMS uh, can also help you with that as well because we can help you kind of define some of those standards and processes, and and then you can. Um, uh, you know, you can you can use your peers to help solve some of your problems because there's there's a lot of mutual uh, heartache uh, on, on this call that you guys fight a lot of the same battles and you can definitely help each other out because it's uh, you're 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 definitely not alone in your struggle. Uh, so by defining the procedure, you know, we're considering a couple of things, the germs, the soils. What are we trying to remove? Can I remove it dry? Uh, the products and application methods. I'll be the first person to tell you. You know, our stuff isn't magic water. Uh, you know, we've been making chemicals for 110 years and one, one of the founding manufacturers in the modern Jan Sand industry. However, there's a lot of good stuff out there. You just got to make sure you're you're picking the right things. And if you have an existing vendor uh, who can help you with that, um, I would encourage you to sit down and talk with them and see what, you know, guidance they can give you uh, on those. Same things with the tools. Uh, one of the things that we do have, uh, in our CCAP program is we, we actually have, uh, it's called quality control. We have an inspection tool that allows you kind of also to define your expectations and you can go through and with a smartphone or an iPad and, and kind of audit yourself. Or if you, if you have a, an outsourced cleaner, a cleaning organization, a contractor that cleans for you, you can also audit and inspect them. Are they doing the things to give you the cleanest facility and a clean, healthy environment? Um, encourage the use of best practices. Um, Again, but we, we need to have what those are defined, you know, goals and expectations of what we're looking for. Um, there are industry best practices out there for how to clean just about everything known to man. 
um, and we can we can provide you some of the information as well and then specify the frequency to get to that standard uh, I mentioned the levels one through five before uh, the APA standard the difference between the standard one and a standard five is not really the task it's the frequency of the task Okay. If I'm vacuuming five days a week versus one day a week, I will probably get very, very differing uh, outcomes by doing so. Uh, so that that's what we look at. You know, I, we're talking about isolating areas that are more critical, uh, you know, daycares, nurseries, preschools or schools that you may have and defining, you know, what those standard operating procedures are, you know, cleaning a conference room that gets used once a week is, you know, at the same frequency that we clean uh, our restrooms is probably not going to be acceptable. So, you know, defining what those are based on soil loads, traffic patterns, and, um, and the stakeholder expectation. Sure. And so, so everyone, just, just an encouragement, you know, we've, we've given you some places, of course, we've got some resources. Hilliard has resources. Your local uh, janitorial supply house will have some resources. The encouragement is, if you want to have a clean facility, you're going to have to invest in laying the groundwork and using these methods of defining and, and understanding uh, how you need to clean, what you need to clean, and how often you need to do it. Um, so that can start with just a pen and a paper yep. uh, going around your facility and, and doing that audit, taking a look um, and, and seeing what, what looks good and, and what looks clean versus what doesn't. Um, so just want to encourage you, it doesn't matter your budget, because um, I'd say raise your hand if you have more money in your budget, an operational budget, than you know what to do with. Uh, and I'd probably get nobody <laughs> raising your hands. I've not seen that in church uh, budgeting. So uh, you've got to be able to, you're asked frequently to do more with less. So if nothing else, really pay attention to those high traffic critical areas because uh, reducing the dirt coming in, uh, especially the entrances and with matting, is going to save you money in the long term. Yep, absolutely. And, and, you know, and when it really comes to asset management and stewardship, you know, obviously for most religious organizations, money doesn't grow on trees. Um, and one of the things that I've always tried to encourage is getting all the stakeholders in the same room and helping them define the expectation so that you can kind of get everybody on the same page. Uh, and, and there's always going to be somebody who sees cleaning as an expense. You know, it's, it's what, what does it do for us? But, you know, you're in, in a industry that is trying to keep people happy and, and attract new members. You know, for, for, for most churches are always trying to attract new members. And so the impression that we make in the very beginning uh, of that process goes a long ways into establishing maybe what the future budget looks like for, for your facility. But if, if we're replacing carpet in seven years instead of 17 years, that's money that the church could have used for their primary mission versus replacing carpet. So some of it comes sure. down to stewardship, keeping the building healthy, keeping the occupants of the building healthy, but just really also just good use of funds. Okay. Well, folks, um, now's I know it's coming up on the hour, and uh, we we'll, we'll go as long as we need to. But I know folks are going to have to start heading off. But any specific questions? I've got one already uh, talking about matting. So Jason, when we talk about matting, um, do we want it inside, outside? Do we want both? What what's a a, a basic rule rule of thumb if we could use that? It's just kind of a, a good way to think about matting. You know, where, where would, do we want it? I would say both if you can get it. However, that may be determined on um, the clearance of your door height. You know, so there's some things you'll need to kind of test if your door opens inwards versus outwards. Some doors that if they open out, you don't have a lot of clearance to the ground. Uh, you got to be careful there. And, and it also depends on what part of the country you're in. Here in Texas, we obviously don't have a lot of snow and ice uh, once every five years. But in New England or the northern parts, having a scraper mat that can help channel a lot of snow and ice debris before it gets into the facility 
is going to really improve outcomes and keep uh, slip fall hazards from from getting inside the building as much. But um, a matting, 15 feet of matting, whether it's inside or outside or a combination, seven inside, seven and a half, you know, inside and outside, is really the magic number. If okay. I get 20, I, I probably can keep 90% of, of the debris out. But you really kind of kind of gauge it by where it can be most effective. Do you need scraper mats? Does an entrance mat work for you? The one thing that I will say uh, about matting, um, and, and I'm not saying this because we have anything against rental companies because we don't, um, but usually the matting that you will find from a rental company is usually going to be a lower grade olefin based mat which doesn't do a very good job of collecting and holding soils, which is really what a mat is supposed to do. Okay. So finding one that is a higher quality, higher grade, uh, has a face weight, you know, usually a 40 or higher, it, it is going to help you contain that stuff more, particularly for those of you who have more inclement weather uh, up north, uh, really for ice and, and snow and, and water you know, capturing, you're going to need something probably with a, a 50 to 70 uh, basis weight facing on it. That's going to really be able to channel that stuff. Okay. Um, so we, those are the kind of things to, to look for. Uh, 15 feet, really, no matter inside or outside is, is what you're shooting for. All right. Next, uh, next question we had come in talking about dust removal, that fine dust that everybody loves. Um, oh, yeah. Best, best and worst solution. How, what do we do? Are we talking a HEPA machine, uh, you know, or are we talking a feather duster? Uh, what, what do we, what's the best and what, you know, what should we consider and what should we maybe avoid? You know, I would say on the spectrum of what to avoid, the feather duster would be number one. Um, anytime that you can trap and contain a, a soil or dust, particularly, you know, fine, fine dust, because uh, it usually creates the bulk of the indoor air issues and respiratory problems, we're always better off. So whether it's a microfiber cloth, a pre-treated cloth, like, you know, a Swiffer type uh, situation where it's cap capturing the dust. But the, the best and really the most efficient way is to uh, trap it in a vacuum bag. So vacuuming is the most efficient way, according to ISSA, the most efficient way to collect particles. Now, the reason why that's important is because we were thinking, well, how would I dust with a vacuum? Believe it or not, you can. Uh, if you have a canister vac or a backpack vacuum, uh, backpack vacuum cleaners are about the most efficient way of vacuuming floors in our industry. Um, they do remove almost as much soils as a, a traditional beater bar type. But what they do have on them is you can change the tools to where if I go into an office environment or I'm in a sanctuary and I'm wanting to dust, you can there are, there are dusting tools that you can use on those. And what they're doing is they're physically removing the dust, putting it in a vacuum bag to be disposed of. If I'm using a if I'm using a more mechanical method of wiping it and putting it back into the air, I'm going to have to fight that battle again because it's just going to recirculate the the air handling system is going to blow it back on top of the fixture I just took it from. It may take a couple of days or a week, but it will come back. Sure. Uh, so uh, I would say for dust, you know, feather dusters would be the worst. A, a dust containment textile, whether it be microfiber, Swiffer, something of that nature, is going to be good, uh, much better than feather duster, but vacuuming containment is going to be the most, the most efficient and most cost effective actually as well. Okay. Um, got a question on, on flooring surface and, and do you have an opinion on when we're talking about entrance areas, what's the best surface? So uh, in the industry that you found in the commercial uh, areas you've been in, what do you see used the most and, and seems to be the most effective? Well, if you look at if you look at carpet, most people hate carpet. But really, from a um, from a science standpoint, the reason why carpeting was had been so popular is with if it's properly maintained, it is the best way to capture soils and keep them from migrating throughout the building. Um, our problem is we typically don't think to clean the carpet as often as we should. So if it, think of really two scenarios. If I were to take a, a uh, if I'm standing in, in a, um, say, a 500 square foot part of your facility, and I were to take a, a uh, mason jar full of sand, and I were to take that sand, and I were to throw it up in the air pretty high and let it settle where it settles, 
probably half of that sand I'm not going to visibly see if it's carpet. Okay, it's going to get into the carpet fibers. It's going to become not as visible. It depends on the the pile of your carpet. But you know, let's say it's a medium medium pile carpet. If I were to take that same on a hard surface, say a ceramic tile or just a hard floor concrete, and I throw that same thing up, it's all going to be visible, right? Mm -hmm. They're both still there. Same same amount of soil still there. One I can see, one I can't. We tend to clean what we see. So what we tend to think of hard floors as being cleaner floors, and they only are because we don't clean carpet as well as we should. Carpet is essentially right. plastic. You know, it doesn't really absorb a lot of things. It's meant to last a long time, reduces, you know, noise. It, it contains soils. From a, from a scientific standpoint, it's better at holding dirt in place. It just requires proper maintenance. We tend to maintain hard floors better than we maintain soft floors. So it really okay. comes down to what appearance level do you want it to have? If, if you were to maintain carpet the same way you maintain the hard floor, you'd be very happy with carpet. But the problem is most people don't. Right. Okay. So because we can see it, because it's more apt to get cleaned and more of the debris removed, hard surfaces on entrance areas, foyers make a lot of sense. Yep. It, and, and particularly if you have an effective matting program, you can accomplish the same thing. But again, you got to have one effective mats and then two, you have to maintain those mats properly. And what we call clean in place matting. So if you get the right type of matting, it's heavy. It's not, you know, it doesn't create a trip fall hazard. You, you actually clean it in place. You can extract it. You can vacuum it. You can do everything you want to do to that mat without having to move it. Because that's why we sometimes use the rental companies. A guy comes in once a week. He folds them up, puts them on a cart, and takes them away, cleans them, brings them back. Uh, problem is, is, is it, there's a tremendous amount of cost in that. If you were to look at your budget for rental mats, you could buy good effective matting 20 times over in a five-year span for what you could, you know, what you'll pay in that system. So, okay, uh, here's a here's a good question. Do you have any thoughts on uh, air purifiers? Um, those the equipment that you know. Do we buy a standalone, or is it a good idea? Do you see it in use? Uh, effective use in, in commercial construction uh, buildings, uh, standalone or installed into the HVAC? What are your yep, thoughts? It, it, it can. And and if you get a chance, uh, Novaris is a company that, that does a lot with it. They use one that is plasma-based, which tends to have a higher uh, efficiency rating to it. Um, there's even a way that it can reduce your utilities. So uh, th there are um, there's different technologies out there. Plasma happens to be the one that we endorse as a company, mainly because we've done a lot of research into it and try to figure out, yes, these things are effective, but only to a point. So they're, they're, they're all meant to channel a certain amount of air, uh, cubic feet per minute. And what, what you have to look at is the size of your facility, what the limitations of any of those devices may be. So if, if you've got a 50,000 square foot facility and you're trying to do a standalone, they're good for about 1,500 square feet, cubic feet, if you're doing a standalone unit. Um, but if you have one that's in line that runs through your whole HVAC system, you can actually treat air as it moves over that system. And believe right. it or not, they're not they're not really that much different in cost. One just requires that you have a HVAC technician put it in and the other one you can just kind of plug and play. So, but yeah, they, they, they are effective. We do encourage them. There's, there's actually good scientific data out there that talks about the efficacy of what they do for uh, airborne pathogens. You see them a lot in healthcare now starting to make their way more and more into uh, non healthcare environments, but yeah, definitely worth investigating. Okay. But, uh, but if you Google Novaris, uh, air purification. It's one that, that one that we'd highly recommend. Okay. Um, we we mentioned and we were talking about backpack backs and the lack of a beater bar. Uh -huh. um, is it okay never to use a beater bar, never to do that on a carpet? It, it really is going to depend on the pile of your carpet. Um, you know, I'm standing in my office here and, and we have a very short pile commercial carpet. It's a glued down carpet on top of the concrete. It it's easy to get with a vacuum cleaner. It's essentially a flat surface. If you have a medium pile or even a high pile carpet, you know, you might have that uh, in, in maybe, you know, parts of the facility. Um, a beater bar is about 20% more efficient in that environment 
but on flat commercial carpet, it's there. It's negligible, negligible the difference between uh, the efficacy or the efficiency of the two. Okay. Uh, and if you have problems, that's when you'd start bringing in maybe a carpet extractor or bringing in a company to to do a professional cleaning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you do that once a year, maybe twice a year, depending on on that. So that was a, a question. So we're okay not running a beater bar uh, as long as the carpet is the is is good, and if you've, you're doing the inspections and making sure it's clean enough for you. Yep, that's right. Uh, what one of the one of the companies that we sell a, a lot of their product, Pro Team, they actually invented the backpack vacuum cleaner. Um, if, if people are um, uh, reluctant to use a backpack, a canister works in a lot of the same way, not quite as efficient as a backpack, but close. Um, they One, they allow you to clean more areas, but because they are more efficient, they allow you to clean more areas more often. So usually if you were to take the same building, introduce uh, standard upright vacuum cleaners or backpacks, uh, and you had them clean at the same frequency, uh, what you would notice is the, the person with the backpacks run circles around the person with the upright, so they're able to clean more. The other thing with a backpack, or even, again, a canister, I can clean more surface types. So we talked okay. about dusting. We talked about things like blinds, air ducts in, in your offices or throughout your facility. I can put a couple of attachments on those, and I can go from floor to ceiling cleaning, and I really can't do that with an upright vacuum cleaner, or not not very effectively. Yeah, uh, your staff won't like you if you ask them to take that upright and lift it up to the ceiling to clean the uh, ceiling <laughs> vents. You'll get a yeah. help. Or, or so, stairwells, or, or you know, even outside. You know, uh, I I've got a I've got a uh, a patio uh, on the back of my house that's um, uh, that's uh, a, a block patio. I take I take my canister out and I vacuum my patio. Uh, again, you know, we talk about trying to keep dirt from getting inside. Um, it, it's one of the easy ways to do it is where I wouldn't do that with an upright with a beater bar. Uh, it just wouldn't make sense. You could, but it really wouldn't make sense. But using using a backpack or canister, you can really do some outside cleaning too. Um, you know, just avoid wet materials. But uh, right. you know, pick them up while they're dry, and you know, you can be a, be pretty effective that way. Okay, and, and the last question I've got so far, and, and folks that are still on, if you got any more questions, send them quick because we're about to, to stop. Uh, using blowers inside a large auditorium, bad idea. Um, I, I'm, I answered that or sent an answer, said, yeah, bad idea. But <laughs> it's because of uh, using those blowers because I've, I've had that question in my worship center asked of me when I was in charge. Could they use a blower to blow everything down to make it easy to sweep up in one spot? <laughs> But like we were talking about, folks, um, anytime you introduce that, just like outside, it it disturbs it or using a feather duster, all you're doing is agitating and uh, throwing up in the air all that fine particles, which will remain in the air until uh, um, until it falls down again. And so you're not actually cleaning it up. You're just redepositing it somewhere else in the facility. Yep, absolutely. So uh, last question that's that's come up. Is there a, you got any recommendations for a brand of vacuum cleaner for low pile carpet uh, or uh, hard surface flooring that you could use maybe both low pile and wood and, and uh, 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 other hard surface flooring, wood and, and uh, epoxy or, or terrazzo? Sure. You know, really, if you look at most commercial vacuum cleaners, um, they either have some attachments or capabilities. You can use a beater bar upright on hard surfaces. Um, the thing you have to be careful of is does it flick them? You know, what kind of skirt protection does it have on it? What CFM does it have? Because it may flick stuff further in front of you uh, in its sweeping action. But I would look at, uh, again, a backpack or a canister that has a motorized head on it. So okay. there are, uh, for instance, I know Pro Team makes one, and, and again, they're not the only one. Most of the major manufacturers will make one, but they make a canister, and they it has an adapter to where you can actually have a powered head on it, so that if you wanted to use it just as a sucking tool and not necessarily one that you would use uh, with a beater bar, but if you want to put that beater bar on there and you plug that attachment in, it essentially turns it into a regular vacuum cleaner that has the same capabilities as an upright. Okay. Um, so as a general recommendation, recommendation folks, uh, you're not going to find the best vacuum at a big box store. Um, they're not going to have the uh, 
long life typically that you're going to want to see or to use. Uh, so get with uh, your local and hopefully you've got one close by or, or seek out or you can even find them online, those janitorial supply companies. You're gonna pay more money for a commercial and commercial rated vacuum. Just just be be prepared for that. A good vacuum is, is not, unless you find a great sale, you're gonna spend more than a hundred bucks. So, um, yep, absolutely. And, and, and just one note, it, since indoor air quality is something that, you know, I'm sure everybody is, is concerned about, you know, in the environments in which we're talking about, um, you will come across this, the sanitaire, uh, bags, you know, the ones with the soft bag on them, the soft ones, you know, Hoover makes them avoid those. Uh, there's a rating in our industry called CRI. It's the carpet and rug Institute. Um, when we use a vacuum cleaner that is CRI rated, it is actually purifying the air. The air coming out of the unit is cleaner than the air going into the unit. So most of the commercial vacuum cleaners that are worth a grain of salt are CRI rated. So look for that tag. It's a little green tag. It looks like a rolled up carpet in green that says CRI. It's something okay. that's going to be meaningful into that. And as Nathan said, you know, you're going to look anywhere from 350 to about $600 at that kind of vacuum cleaner. But if you get a good one, you know, they, they can last you a long time if you, if you take care of them. The other, the other part of that is if you, if you buy one, uh, say at Walmart, it, you may lose your warranty on it. Now that may never be an issue and you may throw it away before that, but th there's always a disclaimer on a lot of those uh, retail vacuum cleaners that if they're used commercially, it voids the warranty. So right. be careful of that as well. You don't hate to get, get trapped into that, but. All right. And I think this might be our last uh, question. Uh, grout in bathrooms. What's uh what's a good way to, to clean that? Gosh, you know, there, there's probably, there, there's multiple methods that if you have the right tool or the right equipment can make that uh, a lot easier. Um, the ones that I like are what usually ones that are oscillating uh, technology. So um, uh, the, there's uh, one called Square Scrub. Most of, the, most of the big equipment manufacturers make one where instead of rotating like a side-by-side -side or a floor machine, a buffer, what it does is it os <clears throat> oscillates at about 3,000 RPMs, and with the right pad on there, um, and it looks like you know the old AstroTurf uh, pad. Put that in with something that has is a peroxide-based cleaner. We make one called Suprox, and what it does, just like it would do on your skin, you know, if you you know remember crashing your bike and your mom would put su uh, put some peroxide on your knee. You see the bubbling. What it does is it reaches down in the grout and actually mechanically bubbles the soils to the top of the grout and it disembeds them in from the grout material itself. The machine just provides the agitation. Um, the, if, you, if you're in a facility where you may not be able you know, to justify buying uh, a big unit, you can actually get smaller ones that are um, you know, pretty cost effective, say two, 300 bucks. Um, they're kind of a little bit of a motor on a stick. Um, uh, one of them actually is called Moto Scrubber, and and those are designed to you know for smaller areas so you can get behind a toilet, you can get under these sinks, you can do that. But uh, something that with a peroxide base, it's going to be you know easier to clean with. Uh, something is going to, and if you don't use peroxide, it needs to be something that's acid based. Uh, it's a light acid. Think of the acid that's in Coca Cola. Most of the materials that are in grouted tiles in restrooms, believe it or not, is mop water. So as we dislodge um, soils by mopping, water will always naturally find the lowest place, and that lowest place in your bathroom floor is going to be the grouted tile. So mm -hmm. microfiber mopping can help prevent uh, the accumulation of soils in your grout, but once they're in there, find something to clean them out. Um, we make a product called, uh, it's a grout impregnator called Repel, but everybody, you can you know, go to Home Depot and they sell uh, grout impregnators. So once you get it clean, it, it's a it's a material that you mop on and it, it, it just dries. You know, there's no it's you know pretty easy application. You just mop it on. What it's going to do is it's going to impregnate that grout so that the soils can't get lodged into it, and it's going to make it keep it a lot easier to keep make it a lot easier to keep clean. Okay, and that that kind of tied into the, the the next question that was received after we started talking about grout is how do you seal it? So you're looking for an impreg once it's clean an impregnating grout. Yep. Uh, a sealer, an impregnating sealer. And, and like you said, most of the 
you can find those in, in stores and tile shops. Um, yep. So. Yeah. And that, the, th the thing we never recommend is if you have grouted, the grouted flooring, don't put traditional floor finish on it. Uh, it's not a best practice. Um, it, it may look good for a little bit, but with the nature of restroom cleaning products, they tend to be acidic. They'll start to delaminate any coating you put on there. That's why the impregnator actually absorbs into the grout. You may have, have to apply it a couple times a year if you have high traffic restrooms. But just keep regular floor finish and wax off of, of sealed floors. It, it's not a best practice. And eventually you're going to have to get that out. And if you've ever tried to scrape or scrub floor finish out of grouted tile, it is not fun. So Right. All right. Well, folks, that's that's all the questions I've gotten. Uh, appreciate those that have hung out and stayed with us. Uh, appreciate your time. Uh, and Jason, thank you very much for your time and all the information you've uh, shared with us today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. All right. And folks, we've got, uh, if you weren't able to download the handouts, I know some folks were having problems with that. Uh, we will make the handouts available on cfms.cool. So go to there and the recording of this webinar will also be available. Please pay attention to the uh, um, after the survey that's going to come in the next day or so, because uh, we'd like to hear some additional topics on cleaning and equipment and what do you want to hear about? Uh, we'd like to uh, hear that from you so we can schedule some more. Next month it's on roofs. So thank you again for your time. Again, Jason, appreciate your time and thank you for all that you've provided. Anytime. Uh, all right, y'all have a great rest of the uh, week, and we will see you next time. Appreciate it.